Edge, so I'm going to be talking to you guys about everything that I know about Elbrus and Aconcagua and then taking any questions you have at the end. Um, just before I get started, uh, in the event of uh, fire or any other kind of disaster, there's uh, the exit you came in, there's the exit behind you there, and there's another exit somewhere behind the screen here. Um, yeah, you you'll find it, you'll find it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, guys, there's fifteen percent discount uh, on anything in store except the sale items, and uh, the till will be open for um, half an hour after I finish. Yeah, cool. Okay, so yeah, um, let's kind of get cracking. Just a little bit about my background. Um, I'm from uh, Ross Gray in Tipperary. It's the place uh, you used to drive past the the McDonald's on the way to Limerick. Now it's where the windmills are. You know, it's the middle of the mainland. Snow mountains around there. That's where I grew up. But uh, I got into the outdoors at a very young age, um, very passionate about uh, mountaineering and kayaking. And I traveled the world working seasons in different countries, worked in India and um, Africa for several years, so the States, all over Europe. And then in 2007, um, I started uh, Earth's Edge. So we're Ireland's only fully licensed adventure travel company. So we run um, expeditions in 40 different countries around the world. Mainly we do high altitude treks like these two, and we also do uh, multi-day rafting, mountain biking, and tri-adventure expeditions as well, which is trekking, biking, and um, rafting all on the one trip. Um, yeah, and then we send uh, an Irish guide and doctor on all of our trips as well. So this is um, Aconcagua, I was there guiding myself in 2015. Um, and just some trips the last couple of years. This is Peak Lennon in Kyrgyzstan, a 7,000 meter peak there. And uh, Musa Atta, it's a 7,500 meter peak in China. Um, yeah, and that kind of covers um, everything I've, I've talked about so, so far. As I said, we place a massive emphasis on safety, um, and all of our packages include flights from Dublin as well. Um, yeah, so this is uh, two of our guides, Louise and Lorcan, on a training weekend in Wicklow. So two months before all of our trips, we do uh, we take you guys on a training weekend just to um, go through everything you need to know about your trip. And also we do two uh, training hikes, so you get feedback on your fitness and we can discuss gear and everything in more detail. You get to know the people on, who are going on your trip, so you can decide uh, who you want to share with in a tent or and equally who you don't want to share with in a tent. Um, yeah, it kind of gets to know each other, it's really good. So guys, I'm just gonna, f I've got two trips to cover, obviously Elbrus and Aconcagua, so I'm gonna try and uh, fly through them pretty quickly and then take questions at the end. So um, Elbrus is the highest mountain in uh, continental Europe, um, and it's in the Caucasus, which are, which is, it's, the trip is in Russia, you could say, but the mountain itself forms a border with Georgia here. Um, right down beside the Black Sea. And the mountains them themselves, they're, they're about a thousand kilometers long, just um, uh, separating the, the Black Sea from the, the Caspian Sea. So we take, uh, we fly um, with Air France, Dublin to Paris, and then into Moscow. We spend the night there. And the following day, we take um, a flight down to Minerodny Vodny, which is about the size of Nock Airport. Has anyone been there before? No, it's not, not many people have been. Uh, it's really nice. And then from there, we. Um, drive about uh, an hour to Patagorsk, which is the regional capital. Um, it's actually, th that's, that's Elbrus in the background here, guys. It's uh, actually famous for like thermal spas and lot, a lot of people, um, Russians go there for, for summer and holiday. Um, yeah, so from, from there, um, I'll talk to you guys about gear um, at the end, but if any of you need to rent equipment, you can do that in Patagorsk. And then the following day, we drive for four hours um, out to Emanuel Meadows, which is our base camp for, um, for Elbrus. So we actually drive to that camp. Um, that's day, day, sorry, day three. And then just to kind of, I suppose, the crux thing of what makes our itinerary a little bit different to uh, most companies on Elbrus is we, um, we ascend the mountain from the, from the north side. Okay, when you hear north face um, on on uh, mountains you tend to kind of think it's really hard. It's just the north, north side of the mountain. It's not very steep. There's no technical climbing in it. Um, but the big difference is there's no infrastructure on the north side of the, the mountain. It's completely remote. So there's way less people. Um, so that's basically why we go there. There's less people on it. Um, this is a shot of the south side itinerary, guys. And just to explain that to you, um, let's say off shot here is a big uh, ski town called um, Terskel. And when you're climbing from the uh, south side, you take a cable car from 2,200 meters 
up to 4,000 where the barrel um, barrel huts are. And then on your summit day on the south side, you drive in a piece machine up to 4,700 meters. Okay, this is called um, up to these, this rock outcrop here. And then the last, uh, you can see actually the, the kind of the road in that slide, guys. You can see the kind of scar on the mountain. And then the last uh, 900 meters, you walk to the to the top of the uh, western summit, which is this one here. This is the eastern summit, and this is the western summit. This one is about 40 meters higher than the eastern one. Okay. Um, so the 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 big difference is that summit day takes about 12 hours. Okay. And then we go from the uh, north side. So this is the base camp, Emmanuel Meadows here. And then there's one high camp, which is about just about here, guys, in this moraine here. And then from that high camp, we go all the way to the top on foot. Okay? So the difference is um, on this side, the summit day, after you get out of the vehicle, it's a 900 meter ascent. Okay? And on this side, you go from here to the top, and it's 1900 meters. Okay? So it's the difference between 12 hours and roughly 16 to 20. So that is the big, big difference. But for me, I suppose, and the, the company, our ethos is we, if we're going to do something, we're going to do it right. Hence, we don't operate the mountain on the south side anymore. Okay, we want to, if you guys are going to summit the mountain with us, you're going to do it on your own feet the whole way to the top. Okay? Um, so just to show you that, so this is the, the base camp here, Emanuel Meadows. So day four, our first day of hiking, we basically walk up to camp one, which is roughly a, a thousand meter ascent. And you can see the size of the packs here, guys. You're carrying all your gear with you. So some of you guys that have done like base camp and Kilimanjaro before, on those trips you're carrying like kind of a uh, 35, 40 liter pack with about eight kilos. On this it's uh, 60 to 80 liters and you're carrying kind of anywhere up around 15 to 20 kilos, okay? And it's just on this, uh, this section from, from base camp to camp one, okay? Um, so day four you carry up there. Um, depending on, on conditions on the day, generally you're, you're on uh, dirt or gravel the whole way. There's no snow on that section. Okay, so yeah, and then day five, um, so day four we go up, dump half of our gear up at camp one, and then we come back down to base camp. Okay, and then day five we move up with the rest of our stuff. All right, to camp one. And then that's the, on Elbrus from the north side, you've got base camp, camp one, and summit. It's not like Killy or Base Camp where you're, you know, trekking for days. Those are the two, there's two different sections. So Base Camp to Camp 1 and Camp 1 to Summit, all right? It's, you're, it's more of a classic mountain where you're, you're at the same place all the time. So, yeah, we move up there. Then the following day, guys, on day six, we take um, a rest day. Um, so you go up to 3,700 meters. So you need to kind of take a rest at that, that kind of hike, get, a, get used to the altitude, get acclimatized. And then in the afternoon, typically, or depending on the weather in the morning either, we'll go out and practice some skills on the snow. Because from uh, Camp 1 up to the summit, it's in completely on snow and ice the whole way. Now, it's not um, technical climbing. It's basically um, you're hiking on snow and ice. So you, you've got crampons on, but you don't necessarily need to have previous experience to take that on. Okay. Um, the following day, then, we do an acclimatization hike. So we hike um, for about six hours up to the Lennox Rocks, ascend about 1,000 meters, and they're on the way to summit. We go up there just to practice moving on the ice, and then we come back down to base camp. Okay? Um, yeah, so it's day seven. Day eight, you take another rest day. This day, you're taking it completely easy. And then all going to plan, you have the crux of this trip, which is day nine is your summit day. So um, effectively, you're, you're ascending all the way up past Lennox Rocks, it gets a little bit steeper for a while. Then you traverse around in between um, the um, east and western summit, and then from there you you, um, you ascend the western summit to the top. Okay, so the the crux of this trip, guys, is it's a very very long summit day. So if you guys think of, of can I just get a show of hands who's done Kilimanjaro before? Okay, brilliant, cool. Um, so, you know, if you haven't done that, maybe chat to the person beside you because more than three quarters of you seem to have done it. It's, if you're comparing it to Kilimanjaro, physically and mentally, you need to add another 30, 40% onto that, okay? So if you found uh, Kilimanjaro comfortable, you're definitely in a good position to have a shot at this. If you're absolutely knackered on the top of Killy or coming down into camp, uh, you need to... You don't, you, you don't want to take this on. It's not the trip for you. It's too hard. Okay? 
Um, it's not the kind of trip where I want to kind of stand up here and kind of get you all signed up and going. It is really, really tough, you know, like, so it's very doable. It's just mental and physical strength. Um, you don't need to be a technical mountaineer. So this is the ascent up, guys. And then this is the saddle um, in between the two summits on a very, very, uh, very, very good weather on top of Elbrus. Um, and then this is the, the route from the saddle up to, uh, up to the summit itself. And this is our team from the year before last on the top. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to keep going, guys. I'll, I'll take questions at the end. So with both of these trips... Um, the we have spare days okay to account for bad weather so on elbrus once you get up to camp one that first time the itinerary from there on is quite flexible in the sense that depending on weather will dictate which day we're going to go for a summit so again um unlike let's say kilimanjaro where you have an exact set uh schedule each day on on, on elbrus and akinkago it's flexible so all going to plan we summit on day nine day 10 is a spare summit day so we can come back a day early um or take an extra day for acclimatization. Day 11, we walk back down to base camp. Um, day 12, we come back to Padesgorsk. And then day 13, we go back to Moscow. Um, you can ignore that uh, forward slash Istanbul there. We're going to go through Paris. And then uh, the following day, we go Moscow to Dublin. And just something to be aware of, guys, the, the only advantage of the south side route is that um, you need a shorter weather window. Because you can basically, so if we get consistent bad weather on the, on the north side and we see a very short window, we can drive around frantically, use all this man-made power to get us most of the way up the mountain and then soup up and down um, much quicker. So that is an option that we don't want to take. But with Elbrus, um, even in the middle of the summer, the weather is really, really unpredictable. And it's the one thing really we don't control. So um, if that were to happen, it is an option for us as well. Okay. So yeah, I'm going to fire on to Aconcagua guys so yeah like highest mountain in South America um, it has a reputation out there of being not that beautiful I was there in 2015 and we've done trips there every year since including the guys from this year they just flew in they got back into Dublin at five o'clock this evening um, I personally found, thought it was absolutely amazing we there's two ways of going up several ways to go up Aconcagua I should say there's two main trekking routes there's the normal route which is very busy and then you have the Vacus Valley route, um, which is a lot less busy. And the advantage of that is it's much more scenic and the ascent into base camp is, is a, a day longer, so it's better for acclimatization. So that is definitely the preferable route. But what we do, I think, is kind of the, the best option. We ascend the Vacus Valley route and then we descend the, the normal route. So we get to see two different sides of the mountain, which is really great. So anyway... Um, with Aconcagua, we fly usually last two years, we've gone with um, Lufthansa via Dublin, Frankfurt, Buenos Aires into Mendoza, uh, which is, this is the city itself. If we manage to get off the mountain like the lads did with a couple of days to spare, it's a cracking place to hang out, a really great steak and wine, and uh, you'll have lost uh, you know, a stone on the mountain, so you'll be really keen to put that back on. Um, so yeah, so basically that gets us Day one, depart to Dublin. Day two, you get into um, Mendoza. You, we organize the permits. If you guys need to rent gear, we can do that there. And then the following day, we drive out to about four hours out to Penitentes, which is um, a ski town that, ironically enough, doesn't get that much snow in winter anymore. This is the middle of summer, obviously. So we go there each every uh, Jan into Feb, which is the summer in South America. Um, so there wouldn't be any snow there at, at our time, but um, I, apparently in winter they get very little snow now. Um, okay, and then from Penitentes, the Aconcagua you can kind of split into sections. It's um, a little bit more complicated to explain, which is a bit nerve-wracking for you guys considering my explanation of Elbrus a few minutes ago. But um, the first four days, okay, we trek... Um, from the trailhead here, okay, all the way in. So one night in Campo Lananas, uh, Casa del Pedra, and then the third day brings into Plaza Argentina, okay? Um, and then from there, then this is the whole upper part of the mountain here. We spend all our time here. And then we descend, uh, after we finish on the, on the mountain, we descend to Plaza de Mules, and in one day walk all the way back out on the normal route, okay? Um, so I'll explain that in more detail. Effectively, this first three days, guys, you're carrying um, 
just your pack, but it's almost empty, just what you need um, each day, because we have uh, horses and uh, rancheros, horsemen, they, uh, they carry all the gear, okay? So these first three days, um, you're hiking in the blistering heat, um, but it's really, really beautiful. And the Vacus Valley, like when I was there in 2015, we only met one other trekking team, so it's, it's really quiet, where this route here gets really, really busy. So this is the, the trailhead. Um, yeah, you basically just uh, pull up on the side of the road and start walking off into the desert here. And you're following the Vacus River all the way up to, to base camp. It's really cool. Um, and this is really funny. I can't remember what this peak is called here, but you walk in from this direction, you know, and as you're coming up the valley and you get to the side of this smaller valley, everyone is looking at this one going, wow, that's huge. Look at Aconcagua. And then they get a little bit further up and they're like, okay, there it is. <laughs> It's about 2,000 meters higher again. So yeah, you kind of really get a, a kind of a sense of what, what lies ahead. Um, so yeah, this is um, Casa del Pedro, I think, and then higher up again, um, really hot. Uh, we get a lot of issues with um, sunburn, despite our best efforts, people get really badly burnt on Aconcagua. And also it's really, really dusty, so we get a lot of issues with um, people ingesting dust and then getting respiratory problems higher up in the mountain. So as annoying as it is, you need to wear a, a bandana really covering your um, nose and mouth the entire time in Aconcagua, which is very difficult. Like the lads uh, just doing this, they're back today, but they're probably two weeks ago coming up here, they had a lot of problems with the heat. They were, it was touching 40 degrees um, hiking up there. So it's pretty tough. Like, the longest day, I think, is the one you go up into base camp. It's about eight to nine hours. And guys, by the way, I'm going to email you all uh, an info pack tomorrow with all the detailed information on this. So don't worry about not remembering the exact details. So yeah, this is just coming up towards base camp. Really, really nice hike, really straightforward. Again, it's just kind of almost like mentally keeping your powder dry, staying well hydrated, acclimatizing well, and just moving up to base camp. So the next section then is going from... Um, Plaza Argentina to Camp 1, which is this little camp here, so this short section. So basically, it's, we cover that over four days. So once we get into um, base camp, uh, the horses uh, dump all the gear, and it's up to us to carry everything we need higher up than that. So the first day, we take a rest day, and we plan, um, we plan basically what we're going to carry. We divide up all the food and the fuel, because you guys need to carry your share of that. Um, and you're basically transferring stuff out of your duffel bag and into your big rucksack. And the following day then, day eight, we do a carry. So we go from uh, Plaza Argentina up to Camp 1. So the base camp, Plaza Argentina, is for 4,000 meters. Camp 1 is 5,000. So going up there, we drop some gear and we come back down. It takes about nine hours. And then the next day, we take another rest day. And then on day 10, we actually move up with the rest of our gear to Camp 1. Okay, so just to show you some photos of that, so, sorry, more detailed map. So basically this section here, okay? Um, yep, and this is uh, Plaza Argentina, this is the base camp. It's basically, uh, it's like, you know, most base camps, you're in a massive, uh, what feels like a gravel quarry, but it's a big uh, glacial moraine. Um, and there's lots of kind of hanging out and messing and acclimatization. Argentina is awesome. The f in, in stark contrast to Russia, where the food is, quite honestly, is very, very basic. I won't, I won't BS you on that one either. In Argentina, it's amazing. Like the, the food, even in base camp, is, is phenomenal there. Um, so there's lots of hanging out, taking it easy. Drafts was a big, uh, the main sport uh, on my expedition. Um, and then here, I'm just explaining the loads to people. So trying to calculate, so weight is a massive issue. Again, when you guys are on Kilimanjaro, you could put in extra socks and jocks and chocolate into your duffel bag. All these little things, they add up and you've got to hook them up the mountain yourself. So you can't really bring, uh, anything extra is going to weigh more, basically. So here, I was just kind of calculating for people how many hours they're going to be walking each day and then calculating back from that how much food they need to carry. Um, and this is uh, coming out of base camp here, guys. You can see Plaza Argentina back here. Um, yeah, and you can see the size of the bags here, guys. Everyone's carrying a lot of weight. 
Um, and this section actually from the first day we carry up from base camp to camp one is one of the tougher days on um, Aconcagua. There's a lot of loose scree. It's not like, you know, dangerous or anything, but it's, you, you really have to get your movement spot on on it because if you don't, it's kind of one, two steps forward, one step back. So there's a bit of technique. Um, and on both of these expeditions, we'll talk to you guys about uh, power breathing and, and rest stepping and um, using your pulls correctly because your, the efficiency of movement is essential on these, on these mountains. Um, and this is the more humble uh, camp one. So up here, guys, as opposed to back in base camp where you know, we're having steak and everyone's chilling out and there's, there's a little bit of glass of red wine for everybody on the mountain. Up here, you're, it's kind of back to basics. It's kind of uh, expedition food, like boil in a bag and uh, you're at high altitudes, so you're not eating as much and you're sharing a very small uh, Trango 2 tent. Um, so yeah, it's more basic, but you know, that's a good thing as well. Um, okay, so day 11 to 14 is going from camp one to camp three up here. Okay, so that's the, the summit camp, that's the high camp on the mountain. So between it and there's a camp two here, which isn't actually marked, this route is closed now. There's a camp in between, so camp three is at 6,000 and there's a camp two at about uh, five and a half thousand meters. Okay, so what we do basically is we typically we carry gear up to camp two um, which takes about four hours on the way up and an hour and a half, two hours on the way back down. Um, and then the following day you move up to camp two, take a rest day, and then you move to camp three. But it's very much weather dependent. Sometimes teams will potentially stay an extra day in base camp or have a rest day in camp one. Um, but sleeping at 5,000 meters and above, really you're, um, you're not getting proper rest. So if we see a, a, a good like a section of bad weather, we'll stay longer in base camp before moving up there. Okay, um, yeah, so just some photos of that. It's really awesome because once you come um, out of camp one and start moving around to camp two, you start seeing a whole other side of the mountain, which is really, really cool. This is a section called the, the Traverse here. Um, and then this is yeah just some of the views higher up. So there's a lot of glaciers all around, more uh, 6,000 meter peaks all around Aconcagua, it's really beautiful. Um, yeah, and just some more photos. You can see the route here, guys, just traversing around. So um, yeah, Camp 2 is just, just around the corner here. And this is, yeah, my team there in, a couple of years ago in Camp 2. And the, sorry, just gonna go back, day 14 then, we go from Camp 2 up to Camp 3. So you guys remember how you were feeling on top of Kilimanjaro, you got that headache, and uh, you're not feeling too good, and then you want to descend back down, you start feeling much better. So although you have much more time to acclimatize, you're going to be carrying uh, 15 to 20 kilos up to 6,000 meters from 5,500. So again, when you're on Kili, guys, you're, you're basically going with an empty bag. So this is a big, big step up physically. And then really at that camp, um, you don't really get a whole lot of sleep just because you're, you're, it's just very difficult to sleep at that altitude and also you're very, very excited about heading to summit or nervous, you know, or whatever your, your thing is. We all react differently, um, but from, from there going up to summit. So, yeah, so just to explain to you, the summit day, uh, you guys on, on Kilimanjaro would have started between 11 and 1 in the morning. It's too cold to do that here, so we gener generally start a lot later, about 5 or 6 in the morning. So the first hour or two is in the dark. Um, you go up to, you get up to about 6,400 meters in about three hours to independent, excuse me, independence hut. Um, that section is fairly straight, straightforward. You're just going over and back and switchbacks um, and pretty much in the dark the whole time. And then the next section in the, the hut is basically just there, guys. I don't know how well you can see that. And then when you have a, a long traverse here that takes about two, two and a half hours, um, to get up into the bottom of the Canaletta. If you guys have re done research on Aconcagua, you'll hear people talking about this all the time. Um, there's nothing really too, too crazy about it. It's just a big scree gully. But getting over to the bottom of it can be really tough because when you come up over this ridge here, you come straight out into the wind and there's really no break from it and it's very, very cold. Um, and then you, there's a little cliff at the bottom of this, like way out of picture and uh, it gets a lot of shade it gets a lot of shade from the w or sorry shelter from the wind but it's in the sun so it's really nice we kind of uh, chill out there have a bit of water have a bit of food 
and then you start climbing up the Canaletta, which takes about another two and a half hours. And it's the, 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 the problem with that is you're very, very tired and it's really loose scree. So as you get tired, your ability to put your feet in the right place becomes, um, gets a lot harder. So you can slip back, but it's definitely not technical or anything like that. It just involves a bit of um, concentration. And then the, the, last, um, the last kind of hour, hour or so is on a, it's not a great shot, on this ridge here. So this is the western face of Aconcagua and the route kind of takes us just below the ridge coming up here. So you can see this shot is actually of people co going down, um, but coming up here and then you're out onto the, the summit. And we had it in a really bammy day as well. We we're very lucky up there. Um, yeah, so it was absolutely awesome. So it's a, again with this one and sim very similar to Elbrus, it's really um, a mental and, and physical toil to get up there. We had, um, the year I was there, there was 11 of us, um, seven of us went to the top. And then this last year, we had a much smaller group. There was only four of them and three went to the top. This year, we had seven clients and three went to the top. So two of the guys got up to high camp and didn't attempt. Another two tried in the morning, but they, they turned around literally outside their tents. So you need really, from, from your perspective, guys, is taking this on, you need to be in tip-top shape. Um, and then you need everything going your way out there as well to, to have a good crack at this one. Because just the, the, being in a small tent for kind of 16 days in a row um, is, just makes it that much uh, tougher. But then all the sweeter if you do manage to get up to the top, you know. Um, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, yeah, but absolutely awesome to get up there. And then, um, so obviously then coming down off summit, we come back to Camp 3, which is really, uh, really, really um, important aspect of this trip is getting that four hours back down to Camp 3 is, is essential. Um, but yeah, and then the following day, we descend um, for four hours. Sorry, that's high camp there. We drop the 2,000 meters down to Plaza de Mules on the normal route. And you get down there, and if, at 4,000 meters, it feels like you're at the sea. You're kind of bouncing around like lambs. The air is so thick. Um, yeah, and we have some champagne, and you know, we, some, of us, some people summon and some people don't. Everyone has a beer anyway. And then the following day, we um, walk, which is a real kick in the ass. This uh, 27 kilometers all the way out to the trailhead in one day. It's a real, uh, it's a foot burner, you know, it's like one of those long hikes. Um, but it's again, really beautiful actually, the hike out. Um, and guys, so that's kind of, the other thing just built into this here, we have two, two spare days, two, two uh, weather days. Now usually like if we have a, a long period of good weather ahead of us, we'll spend an extra day in camp one or, or possibly camp two or base camp. You don't hang out at camp three for two extra nights. It's, it's not a good idea because uh, you, you'll just deteriorate while you're there. But um, they're built in. Or if you, you get up onto someone on the day planned, you head back down to Mendoza and you get cracking on the steak and the wine. It's really great. Um, so just some shots of that. This is um, descending on the normal route. Um, yeah, and the normal route is basically... When you, if you take this on with us guys, you'll, I don't know if you'll remember this talk kind of in a year's time, but you'll be like, God, I'm glad we went up the Vacus Valley. It's basically just switchbacks on scree the entire way, you know? Really nice to descend on, but an absolute nightmare to come up on, okay? So yeah, and then this is just hiking out. And this is in uh, the vineyard. We, uh, actually the last two, three, 2016, 17, yeah, I wasn't on either of them. And I was telling Roland, the guide, you gotta go to this uh, vineyard. It's uh, 65 or $75 for the, to, for, the, for the tour, but you get a five course meal and a glass of wine with each course, you know, and it's just, it's phenomenal, you know, if you've been in a tent for ages, they show you all the wine, it's great. So guys, uh, neither of these peaks are technical, okay? There is, uh, on um, Elbrus, you are gonna be using crampons for sure, okay? But you're not gonna be sending vertical sheets of ice like this. Okay, this isn't taken from either trip. <laughs> Just making sure you're awake here, okay? Um, yeah, so Elbrus, for sure, you'll be using crampons. It's very, very straightforward. There is a section between uh, uh, Lennitz Rocks and the, the saddle that there are crevasses on, but it's, it's really well marked and we can avoid it. 
And as I said, uh, we have an Irish guide, a doctor, and we'll have um, several local guides really familiar with the route. So, um, and then on Aconcagua, you're bringing um, crampons with you, but the chances of you using them are pretty slim. Um, maybe on summit day, but most likely not. It just depends on the weather. Um, if, if it is a case that you need them, it'll just be a, um, like a lick of ice basically on, on the mountain. But again, it's hiking. You don't need to, to be a technical mountaineer. So previous experience on a uh, 5,000 meter peak is highly recommended. I would say it is essential. Like, you know, we get people asking us about, you know, I want to do things like Elbrus or Aconcagua. You, you need a, you know, you need something over 5,000 meters like Kilimanjaro or Mount Kenya, something like that first. These, these are a significant step up. And if you're, if you're thinking about bagging seven summits or you want to do all these peaks, it would definitely make sense to do something like Kilimanjaro or even base camp first. Um, you need to be an absolute animal to take these on. You need to be comfortable uh, carrying weight, like 20 kilos, easy on the Irish Hills, two days in a row, okay? On Aconcagua, on Elbrus, you know what? It's not as essential that you can carry all that weight. There's just that one day that you're carrying. So from base camp to camp one, uh, you've got to carry the gear. After that, you've got nothing in your bag, pretty much. Just what, you know, a couple of kilos of water and, and spare layers. On, a, on Aconcagua, you're carrying a loaded bag pretty much every day except on, on summit day. And it's uh, a totally different ball game carrying weight. If you guys are, are, is anyone signed up to these already? You guys are brilliant. Yeah, and you guys there. So with the weight, if you're going out doing training hikes with, um, with weight on, don't expect to go at your normal pace. This happens all the time. People put 20 kilos on their back and they go for a hike and suddenly they're going a lot slower and getting a lot tighter and kind of going, I'm not up to this, you know? Expect to go half the speed and burn twice the energy. So you need to eat twice the food, you know? So it's really, it's, you're not going to be moving very fast with that kind of weight on. Um, but it is essential. I think it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer, guys. If you can't, if you're taking on, especially Aconcagua, and you're not comfortable carrying 15 to 20 kilos for two days in a row in the Irish Hills, there's not a pup's chance you're going to carry it to 6,000 meters. So I think the key with this, and the key in my experience of, of taking groups out here, the most important thing is that you're honest with yourself and you're in your preparation. Um, because if you have any kind of issue out there, like if you've got a, a small injury or a soft tissue injury, or you're not sure if your gear is going to be warm enough, or you're not sure if you're, you're fit enough, you're not going to summit. Because at Camp 3, and you're in that tent, and it's minus 20, minus 30, you're going to be looking for excuses not to go up there. Um, so you need to really have your... Uh, have your shit together, basically, if you want to take it on, okay? Um, any kind of training will help, guys. Any kind of strength training, cardiovascular training will definitely help. If you're extremely skinny, uh, you need to get fat before these trips. <laughs> Especially, sorry, I should say definitely Aconcagua, okay? So, uh, like, typically I lose kind of six to eight kilos in one of these trips. Um, Elbrus less so, because you've only got that one big day, so... You don't need to carb up or, or fatten up so much. But when you think about it, once you go over on Aconcagua, over, um, once you're over kind of four, four and a half, five thousand meters, you're, you're dropping weight regardless of what you're doing. You don't have the appetite. And just, you know, when you think about it, you're at that higher elevation. You need, your body's working that little bit hard to sustain itself. That's very important. Um, what else to tell you guys? If you have any little niggly injury, like a sore back or a knee or a hip, you need to get that looked at and get it super strong. Um, carrying a loaded bag will put your body under a lot more strain than just hiking without it, okay? Um, yeah, so we do training weekends two months before all of our events. With Aconcagua, we run it in January. We do, um, we do one uh, extra day about six months beforehand just to make sure people are up to speed. Um, but we, yeah, we take you out in, in uh, Glendalough for, for two days. It's optional, you don't have to do it. But um, I think it's pretty essential to, to, to get out there, meet the guide, meet the doctor, get two long days, get some solid feedback on your fitness. If you have any equipment that you're not sure of, um, you can bring it along and uh, we can check it for you to make sure it's suitable. Um, okay, so just to give you guys kind of the bad news and costs and all that. So for Elbrus, we charge three and a half grand. You pay um, a 400 euro deposit at the time of booking, then the balance is due two months before departure. Aconcagua is six grand. We charge a 400 euro deposit at the time of booking. 
We take another thousand uh, about a month, or sorry, six months before we go, and then the balance is due two months beforehand. And guys, as I said, I'm going to send you guys an info pack with the full inclusions and exclusions. But for Elbers, it's uh, you're paying for international flights, domestic flights, um, all your food in the mountain, permits, guide fees, uh, pretty much everything. Uh, things you guys are going to spend money on out there is uh, rental equipment if you need it. Tips for the local guides are about like $75 or 75 euro. Um, when we come back to Patagorsk or before we go up in the mountain, the accommodation is based on bed and breakfast, so your evening meals and uh, you know if you're having a beer, maybe one beer after the climb and one before. Uh, that's it really. Or if you want to go shopping, you can throw down some. I don't know what you'd buy, but you might spend lots of money. Um, and then for Aconcagua, it's again international flights, domestic flights. Um, you need to get your own permit. Okay, we can't book the permits for you guys in advance. I can cag with this year, there are 950 US dollars, all right? Once you go up in the mountain, again, like Elbrus, there's nowhere really for you to spend money, so you're not gonna spend a whole lot. In base camp, they have a dial-up internet that's about, I think, five bucks for a couple of hours. So if you wanna get on your Facebook or whatever, or phone your, or get in touch with your family, that'll cost you money. Really, like I think most people doing Aconcagua, you don't get much change out of about seven and a half grand once you're, you're all in. That's kind of what you're looking at. Um, it is, I'm not too sure, it's definitely possible. I don't have off the top of my head figures on what it would cost to get a porter to carry your gear on Elbrus. But on Aconcagua, um, basically from, to get someone to carry 20 kilos from base camp to camp one, it's about $300. And then from, let's say for, it's most expensive to go from camp two to camp three, it's about 450 US dollars. So, you know, it's, if any of you guys are looking at getting a, a highly paid job, you should go be a porter on, uh, <laughs> on Aconcagua. Um, yeah, so we'll talk about gear in a second. So just guys, um, to let you know, so we have, um, for Elbrus, we've got two trips in 2017. We've got one from the 7th to 20th of July, which has four spaces left. And then in August 3rd to 16th, we're currently full. If you guys want to go on the wait list, you can pop us an email about that as well. And then Aconcagua, we're going in Jan 17th to Feb 6, 2018. We've got five spots left on that. And then uh, 2019, yeah, we've got good availability. So on both trips, we take a maximum of 12 people. It's a smaller group. Um, and again, for Elbrus in 2018, we've got full availability. I will be um, emailing you guys all the details tomorrow. I'm going to send you the info packs and how you sign up. If you want to book this evening, you can do that as well. Just come up and have a chat to me. Um, if you didn't sign up through the link or if you're on uh, Facebook Live, um, just send us a direct message and we'll send you out the info pack. Um, yeah, and yeah, that's basically it, guys. So um, what I'll do is I'm just going to grab this gear and go through that with you, and then I'll take any questions that you guys have, okay? So there's a massive... Um, we have a, a full gear list um, for both these trips, okay, that I'll email you tomorrow. But the, this is only really relevant for, um, for Aconcagua. Uh, this is, uh, these are both products, what's this called? Z? Z-Lite Yeah, it's a Z-Lite. Anyway, it's a, thank you very much. It's a foam mat, okay? And this is uh, a Neoware uh, Thermarest, okay? And both of these pieces of kit will, they're effectively essential for Aconcagua, okay? It's down, uh, they basically keep you off the ground and keep you really, really warm, okay? It's very, very important that you have both of these, okay? And then um, the two, two things you're gonna run into problems with on uh, if it gets very, very cold to your hands and your feet. So you have uh, the option in both um, Patagorsk on Elbrus and um, Mendoza for Aconcagua to rent equipment, okay? But the issue that you have, most people who've rented equipment on our trips haven't had a problem, okay? The main problem with boots is um, if you do rent them and they're the wrong size, you're, you're basically screwed, okay? Um, if they're, the boots are too big and there's too much air in between your foot and the outer part of the boot, your feet can get cold. And if they're too small and your foot is pushing up against the edge, um, they can, you, you basically get a cold bridge and your, your foot gets cold as well. And when I say cold, it gets 
so-called, you've got to turn around, okay? So with renting boots, um, you take a little bit of a risk because by the time you put these on in um, Argentina, you're going to be four days from the shop and on, uh, on Elbrus, you're going to be a full day's drive again. So if you are renting, you need to make sure you get them. Um, you do a really good job of picking out the boots. We'll help you. But if you want to buy them, um, you need basically either of these boots is perfect. This is an 8,000 meter boot, so it's designed for climbing uh, 8,000 meter peaks like uh, Everest. And this one is a 7,000 meter peak or boot. So it's kind of designed for that kind of weight. And they're basically a double line boot. Um, they're very, very warm. And uh, you can always wear them out to the pub when you get home, you know, and <laughs> they're kind of cool. And uh, then your hands are also super, like, very susceptible to getting cold. So you need a pair of liner gloves and then a pair of down mitts as well. It's essential. Okay, these, you definitely need these. Gloves won't work. Um, ski glove won't be warm enough. You need the mitts. And then let me show you some other stuff. So... So this is uh, roughly, this is, uh, let me tell you, it's a 60, it's a 80 liter pack, okay? So this is the kind of size that you need for, for definitely for Aconcagua, and you're probably gonna need that for Elbrus as well. Um, the thing to watch out for these guys, uh, in my experience, is if you're kind of skinny and bony, you want one that has a really good padded, um, kind of waist buckle here because otherwise it'll stick into you so when you when you go for something really light so these go from anything for about uh one and a half kilos to three kilos empty um if you go for something too light um it can be quite uncomfortable but obviously you go for a three li three liter bag it's it's more weight you know so there's a bit of a, a balance to be got there and then um sleeping bag you need one about that's good to kind of minus 20 minus 25 I'll send you an exact list of what you need as well, guys, tomorrow. Um, and then the duffel, this, you need this for, uh, for Aconcagua, okay, to carry all your gear. If you guys are gonna rent gear in country, you need a, you'll get away with a smaller one of these. If you're, um, if you're buying it and bringing everything with you, you need a big one, okay? Usually kind of 130 to 155 liter, all right? And uh, yeah, that's it. So guys, thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, um, far ahead. Yeah, I'm all ears. Cool. Do you just do you have questions there from people online? Yeah. 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 Cool. Okay. Yeah. So just a question here from Martin. If you're an experienced walker in Irish mountains. Um, carrying, carrying a weight of 110 pounds, okay, wow. And do you need to have done other peaks before attempting these? So yeah, I think definitely it's essential to have um, carried, uh, have, done a, have done like a, a peak over 5,000 meters. It's, it's really, really important for sure. Just to get that experience, guys, I'm sure you've all done things like uh, distance running and that, you know, you're not gonna run a marathon on your first day out. So I think that is essential. Um, okay. Is a 20 kg vest okay to, to wear when training instead of a rucksack? Um, yeah, I suppose, but realistically, um, you wanna get used to the, to the pack you're gonna carry. Ideally, if, if you're, if you're gonna be carrying a 20 kilo uh, pack, you wanna train with that same bag on. All your equipment, um, especially stuff that you're wearing next to your skin, where it's got potential to chafe, you wanna um, have practice using that previous, yeah? All right, cool. Thank you very much. Any more questions, guys? This yep. Must be a super one, but for Elbrus, do you need both the duffel bag and the, and the rucksack? So you, you, you don't actually know. You can get away with um, you can get away with basically using the bigger rucksack as your um, check-in bag on the flight, okay, and then bring something smaller with you if you want. Okay. Yeah, because on Aconcagua, this is being taken by horse. Whereas we're driving into um, base camp on Elbrus. So you could bring like a hold all or something else will we'll do fine. Yeah. Could you bring a smaller like 35 liter pack that you can use on summit then? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you, I mean, these packs, uh, yeah, if you want to bring a smaller pack for a summit day, you can. Same on, El on Aconcagua, you see some people bring in a pack, 
It's less common actually in Aconcagua because you end up carrying you have like a bag inside another bag to go for a summit. So on Elbrus, it definitely it can work if you want. I mean, to be honest, if you're comfortable carrying the other bag and it's, um, when it's mostly empty, then I would just go with that, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. What about now, like, um, I'm, I suffer from a sleep apnea. I sleep apnea, yeah. And you're up there and you know the air and the, uh, the lack of. Yeah. Um, the very short answer is I don't know, um, but um, if you're interested in signing up, we, as I said, we have doctors coming away with this, so we can get in touch with um, uh, some of our doctors who are more experienced with um, altitude medicine, and we can get an answer for you on that. Um, yeah, I think basic things will just get we we'll get the information and come back to you and give you a categoric answer, and um, but ultimately the decision will be up to you whether you want to take it on or not. You know, I don't see it being a huge problem. Um, if it's not a problem for you in your day-to-day -day life, but yeah, it shouldn't be a problem. Yeah. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. So what about local guides? So on Kelly, on Kelly, there was twenty local guides went on. Yeah. The summit. Is it the same on both of these? Uh, no. So on um, on Aconcagua, we with seven clients, we had uh, two local guides, an international guide, and a doctor. So kind of um, a guide for every two to three people. And on Elbrus, it's roughly um, a guide for every um, three to four people, um, depending on the numbers. But uh, yeah, so we don't have the level of guides that we have on Killy. Um, and the, the main difference with that then is um, we, so on Kilimanjaro, guys, if you, if you haven't been there, basically we have a, a local guide for every two, two of you guys, for every two clients. Um, so what that means, the advantage of that is that if people want to turn around at different times in the summit day, it's, it's no problem. We have staff that can take you down. On both of these mountains, it's not the case. We need to keep a, a strong team for um, summit. So if it ne it's very rarely arises where we have a client that wants to try the summit that isn't um, fit enough to do it. But for example, if you were there and you had absolutely zero chance of getting to the top, um, we wouldn't, wouldn't let you attempt uh, because we need to hold that uh, strong guiding team for the mountain. It's really, really important. Um, but you know, it's not like if you're touch and go, we're going to tell you you can't go. Um, but it's in everyone's interest that we have a strong team for summit. Yeah. What's the story with the food on The food? Yeah, so the first few days you said it was great, and then after yeah. that, yeah, after that, um, you'd be having something, we'd basically be giving you things like uh, porridge or uh, boiling the bag. If you had expedition food or a kind of, um, they have it for sale here, I can show it to you what it is. But it's like basically uh, you add boiling water to um, kind of dust and pasta. <laughs> and it, it, it turns into things like carbonara or, yeah, 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 it's not the best to eat. But it, it is what it is, like we're not giving you absolute crap, like it's, it's, um, yeah, it's basically like kind of, you know, you're talking about something maybe would have four or 500 calories in it and you'd really struggle to eat it. That's why it's kind of good to have. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Thanks very much, man. Yeah, so this one here is uh, chicken and curried rice and this is all day breakfast. So we try and this one's, yeah, it's got beans and a rich tomato sauce with succulent pork sausages baked. They're not succulent. <laughs> And uh, bacon and omelette, yeah. But we've mixed it up a little bit. So make sure this or, for example, uh, super noodles, like Maggie noodles, um, or, uh, okay, I can feel the sausages and that, it's disgusting. Uh, but yeah, it's pretty basic. If you, have, um, if you have dietary requirements, we can generally accommodate it. Um, yeah, we can, or we can advise you what you need to bring yourself. Um, do you have specific dietary requirements? Or? Yeah, I'm allergic to corn. Allergic to corn. Yeah, well, look, as long as you let us know in advance, we can, we can work out a plan. Um, that's the key to kind of, it's, it's never a problem if you tell us uh, at least, ideally a couple of months or worst case scenario, a couple of weeks before. It's when people get on half of the mountain and they don't eat potatoes, rice, pasta and everything. It's a bit of a problem. Um, but yeah, the food in Argentina is good. The food in Russia is, is, is adequate. There's lots, it's edible, but it's, it's, it's basic enough. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. James, your fitness levels could be very high going over there, but there's not a lot you can do to counteract the old um, climatization. Do you counteract that by having enough days up there 
Also, you said a few people didn't make it up on your last trip. Or yeah. Two. Why was that? Was yeah. Um, okay. So basically, um, just to give you guys a bit of a bit of an overview on on uh, acute mountain sickness AMS, the higher you go up the mountain, the less oxygen there is in the air. So um, the harder your body needs to work to adjust to it. Um, so effectively, you need to breathe more, and um, you need to you need to take time to climatize that elevation. I'll send you guys information on that. That's um, worded a lot better than I'm doing it right here now. But effectively, the key is that uh, we ascend to altitude as slowly as possible, okay? So um, with both of these trips, the itinerary is long enough to allow us enough time. So basically, as we try, we try and move up the mountain and then come back down wherever possible. Um, and then in your second question, um, the lads this year, the, the, the guys that didn't go to, to summit on Aconcagua, um, I'm not 100% sure yet because they only flew in this evening, but from chatting on the sat phone and just going over it, one of the lads um, just felt really, really weak um, uh, leading up to the, to the summit day and wasn't getting enough food on board. Um, so basically he just got, got physically quite exhausted and was just way off strong enough to attempt the summit. So, and I think to be honest, the others were, were pretty similar. Um, so it can be a combination of things. It can be just mentally you've had enough of it um physically you know you, you have to keep food um you have to keep water in the whole time and it, it's really difficult to do that at altitude so um despite kind of you know sometimes it's, it's it's no one's fault these things just happen um i know when i was there in um 2015 one of the guys as we as we left for um for summit just as we were about to leave he got, he got nauseous and vomited a couple of times and, and decided he wasn't going to go. Then two other of my clients got, um, just I think like as, as we were ascending up to in a, in a, the first kind of 400 meters of the Independence Hut, they were just a little bit behind the whole time. I think that's very, very difficult to take mentally when you're trying to, when you know you're moving a little bit slower than other people and just decided they want to turn around as well. And then one guy turned around at Indep Indep Independence Hut again, just feeling exhausted from the altitude. Made the decision themselves, yeah, yeah, for sure. For like no, no, no. I like to be honest. Like that's very, very rarely happens. Yeah. You know, it's something that we like to be very, very clear with people, um, especially kind of you know if you're coming from a mountain like Killy, where you know if, if you're up for it, you can have a crack at the summit. This is different. It's 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 a bit tougher. So we just like to make it very clear to people before they're, they're, you know, they sign up with us that um, we'll be doing everything we can to get you up to the top safely. But if it's not your day, it's not your day. You, know, you just have to, that's the nature of these big mountains. You know, it's more, more annual leave, more money, they're more expensive, and the chance of actually getting to the top just reduce. You know? But that's what makes them special as well. You know? like it's, it's really, uh, you've got to love a bit of pain and hardship really to, to enjoy these trips, guys. You know? Does that answer your question, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, um, down jackets and what you wear on your legs. Um, I, yeah. yeah, hang on. Let's get me a little cable going here. Yeah, perfect. Okay, guys, so this is, um, this is uh, an 800 fill down jacket, um, and this is about the heaviest they would stock here in the shop, um, and this is about the lightest you want for something like Elbrus or Aconcagua. The, um, all the manufacturers, like for example, Rab or Mountain Hardware, they have different spec of jackets for uh, different mountains. So you want something that roughly looks like this. Um, it's got to have a big puffy jacket with a hood, but this one is about 600 grams. You want one that's about 800, 800, 900 grams to, to even a kilo in weight. Okay, just a bigger, bigger, bigger jacket. Alrighty, does that answer your question? Yeah, and then on your legs? Like on your legs, like... Um, you're basically going to be wearing, uh, on your summit day then, you could be wearing uh, thermal tights and then a pair of soft shell pants, which are kind of lined uh, trekking pants. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some people would wear um, a Gore-Tex pant over that or a down trousers, but generally just the, um, the, the thermals and the soft shell pants will work. Your legs, you don't need to have as much layering on your legs because you've you got such large muscles in your legs and they're moving all the time. They don't tend to get as cold. Yeah? Yeah, those are soft shell pants. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, no worries, man. Far away, yeah. Um, so the technical aspect, you just said they're Elbrus, so there's a little bit of ice. 
don't yeah. need an axe. Yeah, you do bring an axe, yeah. But it's more for... No, it's just more for... Um, it's just good practice to bring an axe on if you're going on snow and ice. So again, most of the time you're using that as on steep ground, you're using it really as, um, as a walking stick or um, if, you, if you needed it to... In theory, like, you could use it to self-arrest, but that doesn't really work, really, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah, so you... It is, like, just about height. Yeah, effectively, yeah. So we will be showing you guys how to move on ice at different um, gradients and, you know, kind of all of that and uh, getting you really comfortable on that. Definitely, if you have the time and you have the resources, it would be really good to go do a winter skills course in Scotland, but it's not essential, you know. It's... Um, it's not, not very, very manageable, the, the snow and ice in the mountain. Yeah. yeah just uh, another one was the security situation there. Mm. Um, I know there's like George in Russia. Yeah. yeah. There's how set he is. And yeah. Large, you know, there's, a, like, there's also, um, you know, the trouble with Islamic um, fundamentalism in that area. Yeah, so, um, so we're talking about Albers here, guys. So um, Aconcagua isn't on um, any kind of warning list or anything. And Russia isn't on a general warning list, but this area that we go to um, in Elbrus, the DFA, the Department of Foreign Affairs, they advise against all but essential travel. So what they're basically telling you guys is that you shouldn't go to Elbrus unless it's essential for you to go there. So again, you know, like we're not, no one is trying to BS you here. You need to read up the information and have a look at it. And if you feel yourself, you know, it's not safe enough for me, then you shouldn't go. Um, from my personal opinion, I don't see the big problem with it. I'm happy to go there. Um, I think the last time they had an incident there was either, I think, 2011. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, I just, I, I'm just kind of conscious I'm being recorded here on Facebook and it's up there. Don't want to come out with something. I, yeah, I think um, there, was, there was an incident there for sure, but it's, it's, it's quite a while ago. But as I said, it's up to you to decide um, whether you feel it's safe or not. It's your, your call. Again, we have information on, on the info pack just to, to, to make sure you've read that and uh, you make a call yourself. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yes, uh, sorry. Can, no, go ahead, man. Yeah, for, so basically, Diamox, guys, um, is a, ta an op a tablet you can take, which um, it, basically you take it for uh, 250 milligrams. Um, Snap it in half, 125 in the morning, 125 in the evening, and it uh, effectively um, causes your liver to excrete more acid, which increases the um, oxygenation in your blood. Okay, so a lot of companies, I know for a while, were saying if you want to take Diamox, take it. If you don't want to take it, that's um, up to you. And that's where we were with it, but in the last three, four years, we're advising you to. Um, based on the best recommendation of the 30 doctors that wor work with us, that you should test it for two days under your normal dietary conditions. If you don't have a bad reaction to it, you should take it on these high-altitude tracks. Okay? Um, again, if you go and read online um, about Diamox, you'll hear all the hor horror stories. But um, typically, the worst-case scenario with it is you get um, tingling fingers or numbness in your fingers or your toes. Some people... Um, they can get nauseous on it, or um, I've even heard people getting diarrhea on it. But uh, um, again, if you test it and it agrees with you, I think, um, and you're happy to take it, then it's a good idea to, to take it. You know, it's a personal decision, but we would recommend it. Yeah. Cool. Yes? Um, do you need both the therm arrests in for Elbrus? No, you don't. Yeah. In, uh, in Elbrus, you're either. Um, in a fixed tent where there'll be a mat or you're in a in a kind of metal yurt um just kind of like or a, a um what do they call them i can't remember it sounds something fancy but it's basically a, a shipping container with bunk beds in it <laughs> yeah it's pretty basic yeah but you don't you're on a you're on a flat surface so it's not as essential these bits of kit like they're you have to have them for uh for Aconcagua. um and if you're doing a lot of camping i'd recommend one of these neo air thermarests they're they're amazing. They, they change the whole experience. It's like sleeping on a normal bed. Yeah. 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 
No, you, you'll need, so the duffel bag has straps on it, yeah. but they're just uh, kind of a shoulder strap. You, you, you won't uh, carry that like with 15 kilos in it. You need to get a proper rucksack. You, you, you could in theory carry, but you'd be very, very sore after it. Um, but yeah, you need, a, you need a bigger pack for sure, yeah. Um, okay, any other questions, guys? Super. Well, thanks very much for listening. Um, I'm going to be around here for the next 20 minutes, half an hour. If you want to have a, have a chat or ask anything uh, in person, um, yeah, come up and say hello. Um, otherwise, thank you very much and uh, have a lovely evening. Cheers.